those are the words. To protect. To keep safe from harm or injury. To serve. To perform duties or services for another person. Does everyone feel protected? Does everyone feel served? Or do some people feel unsure, insecure, and unnerved? When cops pass you on the street, are you harassed or disturbed? Pulled over, pulled out of your car, and cuffed on the curb? Did you fit the description? Were you driving while black? Were you walking while black? Were you talking while black? Were you breathing while black? Were you living while black? Were you unarmed and running when they shot you in the back? Did your mother have a funeral? Was everyone in black? Was she crying at the coffin? Did they have to hold her back? Did they put you on a shirt? Did they wear you on a hat? Did your name become a hashtag when you were more than that? Or maybe you were mourning someone close, but every pew was packed. So instead of sitting down, you wound up standing in the back. Did you know someone who died for nothing more than being black? Did you know someone who died for the crime of being black? Are you scared of your protectors? Do you think they might attack? Did you have to tell your children how to speak and how to act? Did you have to sit them down and explain the painful facts? The uniforms are blue, but the bodies brown and black. Don't make any sudden moves. Answer everything they ask. Don't raise your voice to make a point. You have to stay relaxed. These are survival skills beyond your economic class. These are survival skills if you're alive and you're black. If the sirens start flashing and you have to interact, keep your hands on the wheel, keep your eyes on the dash, only get your license and your registration when they ask. Don't put yourself in jeopardy for arguing while black. If you've done nothing wrong, it can escalate fast. If you reach for your phone or you ask for their badge, you don't want to go viral for dying while black. You don't want to be famous for dying while black and you don't want to watch the officer get off with a slap when it's someone that you love and they're never coming back I don't know what it takes to put on a uniform to risk your life for a stranger to wake up every day and shield us from the danger to protect and serve. That poem named Protect and Serve, a poem about police brutality, is courtesy of today's very special guest, my newest brother, In Q. In Q is short for In Question, which, as you know, I love this. It's one of the pillars of this podcast is to question it all. And so um, it's probably no surprise to anyone that as, as you get to learn a little bit about NQ, if this is your first experience that he speaks, uh, speaks to me in, in probably every poem that I've read by him, there's, there's some sort of connection. Uh, even though we've had very different experiences, he speaks about a truth that I think resides in all of us. But anyway, listen, I'm going to give NQ a little fluffing here uh, as I share his, his prolific life. Uh, so bear with us. And then you'll get to you'll get to meet the poet uh, in the flesh here. So in Q is a national poetry slam champion, an award-winning poet, and a best-selling author of Inquire Within. Inquire Within is about taking your pain and transform transforming it into growth, something that I can relate to. And as I'm kind of transmuting my own pain, Contemplating universal issues of love, loss, forgiveness, and belief, it is, a, it is provocative and entertaining. It is a journey to the center of the soul. You'll never look at poetry the same way again. I know I certainly didn't. NQ is also a platinum, a multi-platinum songwriter penning Selena Gomez's Love You Like a Love, a love Song. I'm sure you all know that one. It's a jam earning him a BMI award. He's also written for Mike Posner, Aloe Black, Miley Cyrus, and Foster the People. Among some of his other groundbreaking achievements include being named to Oprah's Super Soul 100 list of most influential thought leaders. He's been featured on A&E, ESPN, and of course, HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. Fun fact, NQ is the first spoken word artist to perform with Cirque du Soleil. NQ has also been invited by leading organizations such as Nike, Instagram, Spotify, Google, Lululemon, Shazam, and the Grammy Foundation to motivate their teams through his keynote speeches 
an acclaimed storytelling workshop, which is a transformational bonding experience for companies who want to share their story more authentically. So be sure to reach out to NQ and his team if you have uh, an organization that you would love to have him come in and share that bonding experience. Ultimately, NQ writes to entertain, inspire, and challenge his audiences to look deeper into the human experience and ask the questions about themselves first, their environment, and the world at large. Welcome to The Great Unlearn, my brother in Q. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, let's just jump right in. Let's, let's talk about um, Protect and Serve, because that came out quite recently. And um, It was written years ago. Of, what? Yeah, yeah. It was written oh. like... Uh, not, not surprising. I guess this has been going on for a long time. Yeah, it was written uh, probably, I think, three years ago now. And, um, and it's in the book Inquire Within. And, um, and obviously with all of the, uh, protests and, um, the movement that, uh, has taken over not only America, but globally, uh, we decided to take some of the clips and, uh, put them together to, uh, the audio book recording of of the poem yeah it's amazing and um i just shared what was on insta what you had posted on instagram and if you're watching this on youtube you'll have seen the video uh, if you haven't yet you can certainly go to uh my instagram or inq's instagram and check it out it's, it's really powerful um you mentioned in that in that post that you're supporting the equal justice initiative Black Lives Matter and the Bail Project. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about why, you know, maybe you landed on those organizations to support. Um, I, I know for me, for one, the Bail Project is something that I, I really knew nothing about. And I had a, an old college roommate on recently who was a defense attorney in Massachusetts. And he really, uh, really woke me up to the injustices of the bail system and how projects, you know, like the bail project can really um, transform or at least help those that have been, you know, incarcerated before they've actually been, um, you know, they're, they're, the crime has been adjudicated. And so I'm curious to know um, a little bit more about why those were the ones that stood out for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter, it's obvious why that stood out to me, because that's been the leader of this movement. And that's um, been really resonating with everyone. Um, and I've always been uh, in support of that. And I've always been really frustrated when people said all lives matter and gotten into multiple arguments. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, that was a, a clear choice. And then to be honest, the other two originally we saw on The Daily Show. You know, I'm an avid, you know, watcher of The Daily Show. And it was something that they were supporting. So then we did a little bit of research in terms of the two organizations and uh, landed on those. But really, we just want people to do anything that feels like they're supporting an organization that is pushing forward uh, equality and justice. Uh, the prison system, the bail system, um, all of it has just real systemic racism and it needs to be looked at and real changes need to be made. Um, so, you know, we even said in the post, I mean, any, anything that you, you know, uh, any other organizations that you feel like more match what you want to move forward, just in some way get involved. Yeah, and I think that that especially coming for someone who's in the public like you are, it's that invitation that that really allows others to just step into it in whatever way that that they feel called. And sometimes it is it's like writing a, a check, a small check to one of these organizations, or it's 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 donating your time locally. But I think for a lot of us, sometimes we just we we're frozen by the enormity of it. And we don't realize that it's just the little steps. It's a bunch of people doing taking the little steps that actually 
creates the the systemic movement and the change that that this calls for yeah i think that's in every area of life by the way you know the only way you can get to the big things is by starting with the small things you know the only way you can get up the mountain is by taking the first step and um growth is incremental and accumulative and change is often in- incremental and accumulative and it comes slow but it happens fast and so i'm really hoping that this uh movement is more than a moment which has been the issue I think in the past that uh, consumerism and capitalism move so quickly and uh, distracts us back into our own cycles um, that uh, movements have come and gone. And, um, and now that everyone has been forced to slow down uh, they've started asking themselves, is this working for me? You know, when, when you can't, make a dollar and you can't spend a dollar and you can't go to the movies and you can't watch sports and you can't go to a concert. It's not that these things are bad or good. These things are incredible, but they're also functions of uh, how society distracts us from ourselves. And, um, and so this is a time period where we can't be distracted from ourselves. We've been forced to sit in the house and be in quarantine. And by the way, just another step, we have to re-examine the prison system in general once the quarantine is over. Um, you know, because first of all, the, the virus has been spread in unprecedented ways behind bars. And secondly, people now have had an opportunity to experience what it feels like in, to just be in forced closure for a month. And think about what it felt like for you not to be able to get out of your home, even with all the modern luxuries that you have. I mean, it's a privilege to be able to quarantine. And now think about how much time we take away from people, you know, for drug offenses and nonviolent crimes and three strike rules. And uh, once again, how heavily that weighs on people of color. Um and uh, the economically disenfranchised in this country. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to re-examine. And I think it starts with ourselves. And then hopefully we start to look around and think, how can we be of service and support? And even in those small ways, uh, they add up and they can make a big difference. Yeah, I agree. And I I love that um, you bring up this idea of reform. And I think for anyone uh, who wants to, to really watch a powerful documentary that really speaks to all the things that you just spoke about is uh, 13th yeah. on Netflix, which is super powerful, um, but really lays out how these systems have been put in place. And that, you know, I think by now we're recognizing that they, they aren't broken. They're actually working perfectly. And that's the right. problem. Right. Um, anyway, just to, let's shift gears for a second. Just so everyone knows, I met in Q uh, through our mutual friend, Aubrey Marcus and Ryan Giles. And so grateful for that intro. And we were going to, uh, when you launched your book, we were going to do the podcast in person. And at that point, like quarantine was just starting. So I'm like, hey, let's just wait. Who knows how long I'm going to be, but I'd love to do it in person. But as we found, it's gone on and on. And I didn't want to wait any longer. I've loved your work. Uh, I, I So when I bought the book... I do what most people do. I open the front cover and then the first like little acknowledgement or, or, or whatever, I don't know exactly what it's technically called, but this is what it says. Defining myself is like confining myself. So I undefined myself to find myself. I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> that's my guy. Oh my God. That's the unlearned. Like, that was it, brother. I and I think I, you and I had just been in contact through email, and it may have been on Instagram, or whatever. I took a snapshot of. I was like, "Dude, are you shitting me? Like, you're, you're like, you've got me." And then it was like poem after poem about growing up, about dad, about mom, about home, about it was, it was, it blew me away. Um, and so. You know, you just never know how these connections come about. And so I'm super grateful, um, you know, the relationship I have with Aubrey and with Ryan that, that yeah, shout out to Aubrey and Ryan. Yeah. Thanks fellas. Um, 
But anyway, let's let's talk about the book a little bit. For okay. one, I, I want to start. Um, actually, I got two things I want to start with. I'm going to start with the cover. But before we do that, on the front cover, it says, "If you change your present, you change the past and the future." I'd actually never heard that before, um, and. What came up for me on that is, is, and I think I, I'd never heard it before because if I've read it, it didn't make any sense to me. So I just brushed it aside like, what the fuck's this guy talking about? But when I read it recently, if I understand correctly, if you change the present, if you change your state of gratitude and just understanding all the things that have happened and take them as lessons and opportunities for growth. And you really change that lens on the past. And it's no longer wounds and trauma. And it's not to say that we just still don't have them. I still do. I'm still working with that stuff. But it's really the idea of looking at those experiences, healing them, and using them as medicine for now and moving forward. And so that's my non-poetic um, interpretation. So I'd be curious to, to like what, what lands for you with when you, when you come up with that, when you're inspired to write that. Um, it was in the middle of a poem that I actually didn't include in the book. And, um, and yet it felt appropriate to put on the cover. And I think the meaning that you made out of it is perfect. In general, you know, if you still have wounds in your life, congratulations. <laughs> you're, you're still alive, you know? Um, and there's a lot of potential for you to evolve and to use those experiences, um, to, uh, to grow internally and externally. Um, what I really mean, or, you know, the meaning changes, I guess, over time for me, but, um, Right now, what I mean by that is if you change the present, you change the past and the future. So if you do something differently in the moment from what your normal pattern is, you know, let's say we all have these records that are on repeat, you know, and if we change the record in the moment, then we also change our perception of the past and we change our manifestation of the future. I mean, time doesn't really exist anyway. I mean, it, it does here. Of course it does. And I'm not talking about some metaphysical things, very logical, like time changes depending upon your size and your speed, you know? So if it's relative, then does it even exist? Well, it does here, you know? So um, that's the first part. And then the second part is if you change your experience in this moment of reality, then since time is relative, you can potentially change your experience in every moment of reality. I love it. And, and, and I think that's, I love that you bring up the, you know, really, if you don't have the wounds, I mean, arguably it's just a, a, a lack of awareness about what's going on and, and that's okay too. Sometimes we need to be in that space. I know for a long time, that's where I was because I didn't really have the tools to go into those wounds. They were too right. painful. It was too, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really challenging when you don't have the support system. You don't understand that it's not your fault, you know, that maybe you drew it in, but you drew it in to have an experience to teach you something. And sometimes we're just slow on the uptake on the, the teaching part. Yeah. There's a lot of pain or, uh, I, in general, like society is so afraid of pain, <laughs> you know, we're all so afraid of our pain and there's a lot of power in pain. I mean, you wouldn't even in, in this world that we're living in, you have to have, and you've heard this a hundred times, but you have to have good and bad. You wouldn't know good without bad. You wouldn't know light without dark. You wouldn't know pain without pleasure or pleasure without pain is actually the way to say it. But, um, and so there's power in all of these experiences that we're having. And usually what people do with their pain is they're kind of on two sides of the spectrum with it. They, they either ignore their pain, you know, distract themselves from their pain, blame other people 
for their pain. You know, and that's kind of one side of the spectrum, which I've certainly done and continue to do with various degrees of, uh, you know, success and failure. (laughs) And then the other side of the spectrum is you uh, exacerbate your pain and you victimize yourself, you know, and you swim in it and you almost love the attention of being depressed and all of that, which of course, you know, I still have to make sure that I'm not on either one of those sides. Um, Happiness isn't a point, it's a range. And the range is in the middle. And you have to be able to acknowledge your pain, you know, not distract yourself from it, ignore it, uh, do things specifically that are unhealthy that make you forget about it, you know, um, that are out of balance, um, or blame other people or blame God. You know, you can't do that. And you can't victimize yourself either. You have to just acknowledge it and actually use it to create rather than destroy. And in that way, there's a lot of power in pain. So that's why I said, congratulations, you're alive. You know, anything that you ever had happen to you in your life, whether you understand it or not, it happened. And if you can find a way to take responsibility for it, maybe not logically, but just to take responsibility for it and find gratitude. And if not gratitude for the experience, because it was so traumatic, you have to find gratitude for who you are right now, which is inseparable from what happened to you. You can't separate anything that happened to you from who you are right here and right now. And so if you're hating that thing, you're actually hating a part of yourself. And you have to learn to find at least gratitude for who you are so that you can have gratitude for who you can become. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, and I, I, well said, because I think a lot of times those things happen and we, we do we want to try to outrun them or we want to, like you said, distract and numb ourselves from actually uh, making peace with that pain and that trauma. And, and all the things you're talking about yeah, they're all disempowering. Mm-hmm. We're all we're all giving it to someone else. We're putting our story in someone else's hands. And then we can't do anything. When we are paralyzed, then we are arguably kind of fucked in the situation. But if we can we kind of bless those and listen, people have some horrible things that have happened to them. And I don't mean to make light of that. I know you're not making light of it. And so it, it's 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 just seeing that the thing, and you said it, the thing happened whatever it was whatever degree of pain it caused it happened and so if we can't some way bring that into us then we are disowning a part of ourselves and that is just that just creates this suffering that i think everybody who's listening now can relate to we all suffer varying degrees and there are times when when I feel amazing and then the next day I'm like what happened to me I thought I had it all figured out well you get these moments these moments of happiness where you're just paying attention to what makes you feel really good and as you said earlier it's like taking those little steps like stop this whole paradigm of and I've spoken about this before but that there's a goal there. There it is. That's where I'm going to go. And I'm for anyone who's listening, I'm like pointing in the, in the far off, right? Like that's where I'm going to go because that's where my happiness is. And we're really taught that from a very young age. I know as men, it's like, go do this, go have success. And then at the end you'll be fulfilled and you'll retire and you'll have a wife and kids and all the things. And all the while we're not paying attention. Most of us to what makes us feel really good. And what I love about your poetry um, is that not only do you have this practice of gratitude for these things that are painful, you really pay attention to what feels really good and not making it this grand plan. And I think it's such an important lesson for, for all of us. Like we, we, we need to shift gears here. The old kind of, Unfortunately, the, the masculine way of moving through the world, there are some benefits to it. But when it becomes 
unconscious or toxic. It's just all about doing. It's all about achieving without any sense of presence. And when what I've recognized, when I can invite the feminine in and I pay attention, and someone described it to me the other day, like the, 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 the masculine energy is like electric and it's moving forward and it's initiative where the feminine is accepting and allowing and it's magnetic. And when you pay attention to that and you open yourself up to those things, they will be drawn to you. You don't have to go search and seek out and destroy and whatever we were taught as kids, you don't have to do that anymore. And you can, you can tap into that when you need to. But for me, it was, you know, when, as they say, when, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That right. was my only shot in my bag. And so anyway, I'm curious, when did, did you have a moment where everything shifted for you when you started to use that pain for medicine? I don't have a specific moment. And by the way, I'm writing to myself first, you know, so I'm giving myself uh, reminders of the life that I want to live. And oftentimes the poems that I'm writing, at least the ones that aren't uh, social and political, I mean, even the ones that are social and political, oftentimes they're not problem oriented, they're solution minded. Like protect and serve is a, a problem oriented poem because I don't know specifically what the solution is. And um, I wrote it because I was so angry. And the idea of protect and serve, those two words and what they actually mean um, in comparison to what uh, many Americans experience on a day-to-day -day basis um, just felt like such a dichotomy. Um, but most of the poems that I write, they, uh, at least try to come from the perspective of being solution minded. And, um, and I'm, like I said, I mean, I'm really just talking to myself and then I have to almost catch up with the poems in my life. You know, and what's cool is I have an opportunity to speak them out loud over and over again, um, which calls them in. It becomes a declaration to the universe or a manifestation. But uh, I don't look at myself like, you know, I uh, am as enlightened as the poems are. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not. I and. And I like that. I think that because, comes through, by the way. That really okay, comes good. through in your work. It is fucking raw, honest. I've got shit I got to take care of. Like I, I, I think that's why I it just immediately connected with your work. It's because there is so much truth. There's no you. You don't sugarcoat a goddamn thing. And Thanks, I think man. people recognize that. I think that's why you're considered one of the greatest poets living today here in the United. It's like you. There's no bullshit and it's not, it's not esoteric. It's not out there in la la land where, you know, for someone like me who doesn't have much experience with it, poetry, like, I don't need any experience. You're just talking about the human condition in a way that is so true. So anyway, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry. I just felt compelled to share no, that. I, I appreciate that, man. Thank you for saying that. Um, but I, I, I do, I do think that, the reason why I'm almost clarifying is because there's this celebrity culture thing that happens in America, but it's really all around the world. I would say it's more prevalent here, though, where we are trained to look up to people or to look down on people. And we never look at people. And so, you know, when someone's on stage and they're saying these things so passionately and powerfully you know, oftentimes people will project things onto you. And so they'll come up to me after, oh, and they, they say all these things. And I'm always like, hey, look at me, man. Look at me. Because there, what happens when you look up to someone or you look down on them is you separate yourself from their experience. And you oftentimes, number one, lose empathy and compassion, right? But number two, even their accomplishments or their failures, they seem so far away from your own life. 
that their accomplishments are like, you're like, well, they're special. They, I could never do that, you know? And their failures are like epic because they were on such a pedestal that, ne- you know, they have this purity test that they can, and now they're falling. And you don't even look at your own life to see how whatever that looking down on them, how that shows up in your own life. You know, so that's why I, I say that out loud, that I'm definitely a work in progress. And part of how I do my work in progress is to write these poems. Um, I wanted to say something else about protect and serve. You know, when I'm writing uh, social and political pieces, I know that there's a part of me that's going to get those pieces wrong. Like specifically for this, I, I haven't experienced that type of discrimination myself. So it has to be imagined, you know, it has to be empathized with to express whatever it is that comes out in the pieces. Um, And yet I know I'm going to be partially wrong. And what I'm trying to do is get the least amount wrong that I can so that the other people that listen to the poem are put into those shoes and can feel what it would be like to experience that And hopefully that will open up their minds or open up their hearts a little bit. And hopefully that will then cause them to change something small in reality. Um, Because that's the highest compliment. I mean, if someone feels something or thinks something, that's wonderful. But if they change something in the world for the better, then I feel like I'm really doing my job as an artist. Um, And yet I think that people are afraid to step into the social and political range in their own lives often because they're so afraid that they're going to get it wrong. And then they just don't do anything. And, you know, specifically for police brutality or systemic racism, this is not a black problem. This is an American problem. And anyone that has integrity or morality has to be on the right side of history now. Um, you know, so I, I, that came into my head. So I wanted to make sure I, I said it out loud. Yeah. I love that you shared that. And I think, um, I definitely resonate with not, not, uh, not knowing what to say for a long time. Part of it was ignorance. Part of it was wanting to be liked by people. So not saying anything that was going to be controversial. And I think more recently I've understood that as long as I tell the truth from how I feel it, not what I'm thinking, but like what feels right to me. Like that's all I can do. And there are going to be people that aren't just, it's not going to feel good to them. And um, I have to understand that if I'm just, if I'm telling the truth, like I know it, that's all I can do. And if they have an issue, it's not really my issue. I can try to help them work through it. But at the same time, it's all about that, that integrity and um again, which is by the way it. an uh, uh, an ever changing thing i mean if you know for for both of us or anyone who's listening to this if you're awake you know the only thing constant is change and so even my integrity changes there's shit i've done over the years that i look back on and i don't regret i don't like to use the word regret but there are things that i'm ashamed of You know, things I've said, things I've done that, you know, I look back on and I've learned. And that's a good thing, you know. So, uh, you know, I think people just think integrity is some set thing. Yeah. And it's not. It actually is elastic. Um, And if if you're living life right, your integrity uh, grows. Yeah. And, and it's, well, I'm glad you brought that up because it, my, w- one of my favorite things to say, and it's in my Instagram bio, but I, you know, I reserve the right to change my mind. And I think we're not taught that our fucking, unfortunately our politicians, that's not acceptable. So now they're, they voted some particular way, or they have this stance that they, you know, have, have, um, supported And now if they change their mind based on new information, based on a new experience they've had, 
they look like they are just catering to the other side. And it's unfortunate, but the, I mean, the political system has its, its issues, but that's certainly one of them. And I think as men for so far, I mean, I'm going to speak for myself. For so long, I was just offending shit that I didn't really believe in, but I believed in it kind of, and then I didn't want to be wrong. I didn't realize there was no right or wrong. I didn't realize I didn't have to know everything. You know, as 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 I got older, within the last couple of years, I started to really embrace the idea that I don't fucking know. I don't know. I'm not supposed to know. I'm actually supposed to be curious. And with that curiosity becomes it gets more learning. Mm -hmm. But if I know, as you know, if you know, you're just, the ears are turned off and I'm just looking for a way, a hole in your argument where I can attack it with the one little quasi fact that I know. Right. And it's like, once I've dropped that, oh, I mean, what a burden that is to carry, to have to always be right. And we see it, I mean, I see it now around me so much and I have so much compassion because I've been there and I know that it seems like you're coming from a position of power, but you're in a goddamn prison and mm -hmm. you don't even realize it. And it's it's suffocating. Yeah, I mean, uh, I talk about this in the book. There's a line that says, you will always find the evidence for what you choose to believe. And if you look at beliefs in general, you know, ideas are meant to be elastic as well. <laughs> They're meant to be explored. Um, but if an idea becomes an ideology, then the ideology literally can become a part of your identity. And if it becomes, if an idea becomes your identity, then for you to change your mind, a part of you has to die. And that's why people will do anything. They will actually kill and die over ideas without looking at any other evidence. And I think, you know, to your point about masculinity, um, there's this survival thing, you know, like we hunt and we survive, you know, and all of the, and you, you almost like are tricking yourself into thinking that your ideas are a part of your survival mechanism. Fuck yeah. Like, like they're fight or flight, like, you know, and, um, they're not. And once you even have the acknowledgement and the awareness that they're not, at least a little bit of space opens up. You might not stop that trigger of wanting to defend yourself to the death, you know, but you at least know that it's imaginary. It's really completely imaginary. Um, and so I think there's a lot of power in uh, coming to that understanding. Yeah, and, I, and, for, and for those listening right now, if that's starting to stir something up in you that doesn't feel comfortable, that's that's good. That's information. That's showing, I would say, that's showing you where you're not quite free right now. And so that's an opportunity to go into that identity and look at it for what it is and see how it's served you up till now and how long or how it's maybe no longer serving you and and do the work because it is, I know you've done the work, I've been doing the work. As we start to peel away these identities and to disassociate from them and to thank them for what they've done for us, in the beginning, man, it's terrifying because that's all we really know are the all these masks that we put on that we, you know, we build ourselves up and we show up in all these different ways in all these different situations. And we think that's what we have to do. Well, it becomes very confusing when you have different people around and you're supposed to be different ways with different people. And and really the probably the the biggest, the biggest message that's come through for me lately is to just show up as me. And it's so funny. Fuck, dude, today. So before we got on, I have a, a friend who runs a hockey camp. Mm -hmm. And so he's in Austin running his hockey camp. And he's like, fuck, Cal, come out. Come out and skate with the kids. So I grew up playing hockey. I played a little bit in college. And then I really haven't played for probably six or seven years. I'm like, Oh, it'd be fun to go out on the ice with the kids, you know, and just whatever. It'd be, f I haven't done it. Fuck. I went there. I spent an hour on the ice with the kids. 
and dude, I, I didn't have to think about anything. Mm. I just showed up as me. Yeah. And, and, and it's as free as I've ever felt. It's, it's something as simple as that. I had no idea. I had no fucking idea. Like, you know, when you're engaged in the work, sometimes there can be an intensity around it. Like, Ooh, I'm going to read this book and do this. And I'm going to work on this and meditate on that. And I'm going to talk to this coach and this healer. And like, I feel like I'm in the midst of that right now. And the greatest lesson I've received for free was just show up as you mm-hmm. just go. And I, I had so much fun. I was shit talking with the kids. I was hooting and hollering. I was a kid again. Yeah. It's like, fuck man. Like what, what's the point of all this? If, if in your doing the work and this keeps coming up for me and doing the work, it becomes, it gets, gets a little, little bit more intense, a little bit. And, and it's under the guise of, Oh, I'm just doing this personal work, but, but it's, I'm not in the experience. And so anyway, you just never know when these lessons are going to show up to just fucking be you. Who mm-hmm. are you? Yeah, I mean, part of the work is to play. Fuck yeah. So, you know, it's important to uh, remember that. And r- really what play is, is uh, it's just exploration of something. You know, it's being in the moment. And um, when you're a kid, you're constantly exploring. You're constantly in the moment. And then as adults, we, uh, you know, we find something to do for a living. <laughs> you know, something we can get paid for, maybe something that we're good at. And uh, oftentimes we get into the seriousness of our roles, of our identities, and we calcify. You know, actually growing and changing becomes unconsciously very scary for people because they don't want to look foolish. They don't want to look like amateurs again. And, uh, you know, welcome to the world, man. (laughs) I mean, nobody knows what the fuck we're doing here. We're literally spinning in the middle of space. You don't know where you come from. You don't know where you go. We have ideas, we have theories, you know, we have religions but no one really knows, you know, there's more space inside of us and around us in the universe than there is anything solid. You know, if you zoomed out, there's more space up there and more space in here and our cells, you know, it's like 99.9, you know, whatever, empty space. So we're really just like a sea of energy, you know, um, a moving consciousness and that has separation within this realm that we're in. And, uh, you know, it's okay not to know. It's okay to uh, not be on the ice for six years and then get out there and be a little bit like, oh, I have to get back into it. And, you know, I was playing basketball the other day. I hadn't played basketball in a long time. And it was like embarrassing, but it was good embarrassing. You know, I felt alive. And um, I was saying this to uh, my girlfriend the other day. We, uh, we're in Utah right now. And I've been creating these adventures for myself every day. Uh, we've been lucky enough to come stay out here and uh, have some nature because we were just feeling, you know, a little bit trapped in the city. I'm from Los Angeles. And if you think about it, you know, why are you anywhere in the world? You're there for people. You're there for business and you're there for the environment, you know? And when quarantine hit, couldn't see any of my people, had no business. And very quickly, I realized I don't like this environment. I don't like living around a bunch of dead shit. I need to be in nature. So we came out here and I've been creating these adventures every day. And I said to her, whenever I travel, I used to travel alone all the time. I would create these adventures every single day of traveling. And I would put myself in these positions where I was automatically an imbecile or an amateur. And I felt not great at something. And yet that always would bring me back to growth in the other strengths that I have in my life, including poetry. You know, it's better for me to 
go do something that I'm not good at for my poetry than it is for me to try to write a poem. You know, why would I try to write a poem? No, I should go live and then I'll have something to write about, you know? But I don't create adventures in my own city. And that's what her and I were talking about is I oftentimes will just uh, wait until someone gives me an opportunity to go do something. And I thought, well, what if I started taking like three days a week to specifically create adventures in my own city to put myself into that state of being in the moment? Because when you don't know what you're doing, you have to be present. <laughs> or if you're in a game, you have to be present to the game. Or if you're, you know, so I think people live that through their kids once they have kids, but they never really like, um, or not never, but they don't often uh, take ownership of it for themselves. It's a bit of, yeah, you, 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 you know, some people take it a little too seriously living through their kids, but but I do think it becomes a bit of a cop-out or an excuse because you've got the kids and, and there is an opportunity to play with them in real play and to lose yourself in that. I've had, you know, successes and failures with that for, for you know, my oldest is 17. And so mm-hmm. I've gone through fits and starts with that. But um, I, I think for one, I'm guessing the audience is curious. Give us an adventure or two that you would have in your own city that would that would create this this imbecilic uh, in queue. Well, I mean, we were on the lake yesterday, and I was like, "Oh, let's go rent jet skis." But I don't realize you could rent jet skis in the marina. Like, why do I have to come to Utah to rent? And seriously, it's like, why do I wait to be in this new environment to be this new person? <laughs> you know, I can very consciously create those things for myself. And they don't have to be extreme, by the way. They can be very, very simple. Um, but they have to be conscious because otherwise you're going to get wrapped up in your own routine, your own priorities, and you're only going to do it on vacation. Or maybe not even then for some people. But when I'm on vacation, or I'm on an adventure, I am so conscious. I wake up every single day. I'm like, you know, what are the 10 things I can do today or the five things I can do today, you know, in this place that, you know, and I'm always go up to like the, whoever I'm staying with or someone on the street or the person at the hotel. If you had one thing to do in this city today, and you could only do one thing, what would it be? And it's led me all sorts of interesting places. But I realize that I don't uh, intentionally create that for myself in my home. And I, uh, I want to do that uh, from now on. So it's, it's, that's something that I'm going to, to work on. And really, I brought all of that up to say it's great that you got back out there again. And, um, and it inspires me to do more of that in my own way. Yeah, it's so funny, right? It's like you spend all this money with coaches and doing whatever in the in the books, and it's something as simple as that it is. You know, I mean, the kids, the, like I'm there to coach, and you know, not to be too corny, but like I was the one who got the big lesson today. It's like, fuck, dude, like just go play. You know, yeah. and I have kids here to play with, and yeah, they're getting older, but. um you know, certainly basketball is something that, that my oldest and I like to do. But anyway, without going down memory lane, um, I want to talk a little bit about what you mentioned it, but what, what really inspires you to write this poetry? Um, you're not what I what's clear is you're not sitting and thinking, OK, what does everybody want to hear right now? And let me see if I can go craft a poem, because I think a lot of us, unfortunately, think that that's how we're supposed to uh, kind of make it. We're supposed to, whatever the thing is we're doing, okay, what's everybody who's doing this doing to be successful? And let me see if I can reverse engineer what they're doing versus what do I really want to do? What feels really good? I don't have to have the, the plan figured out, but I have to move in that direction. Like what's something that feels really good? What's something that feels really shitty? Do don't do that anymore. And like pay attention versus, you know, just trying to, again, I just can't, I've been there. 
how's that guy been successful doing that? Okay, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. It's fucking exhausting. And it's, it, 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 there's no inspiration there. Right. So I'm curious, like your, your process. Well, I think artists are definitely entrepreneurs. And that took me a long time to understand. Um, and I also think that entrepreneurs are artists, but it depends upon uh, where they sit on the range or on the scale, you know? Um, for me to reverse engineer in that way as an artist, even if I got to the place I wanted to be, I wouldn't be there, <laughs> You know, because I would be strategizing my inspiration. <laughs> Fuck yeah. And if you yep. strategize your inspiration, I think it's one step away from manipulation. And if you're manipulating your audience, you're manipulating yourself first. Um, now, I can understand why you'd want to do that as an entrepreneur. Um, but even then, it, it's, it winds up coming down to what your goal is. Is your goal to be successful? You know, is my goal to be famous? You know, is my goal to be rich? Or is my goal to follow my enthusiasm and express myself? And then as a byproduct, maybe some of those other things happen or don't happen. But at least I'm really pursuing my own bliss. Um, and so that's where the poems come from. I, I just pay attention to when I'm inspired or when I'm moved or when I'm really angry, and I start the poems there. And if I give it enough time and space, the rest of the pieces will almost uh, write themselves. Um, I, I have to like get out of the way sometimes for them to move through me. But I can't not be there or they don't show up. So uh, yeah, I've just trained myself to like pay attention to when the muse shows up and not take it for granted. That's awesome. It definitely comes through with the work that, that, that I've read. And, you know, again, I, I think, I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of little lessons throughout this podcast. We've already shared some, but, but I, I think for someone who's had, let's just call it, you've had this measure of success um, by the Western standards, but what, brings you to the table each time is tapping into that true inspiration. Like, what is it that's coming up for? Like, what is that pain? What is that energy? What is the emotion? And how am I interpreting it? Like, what's going on for me right now? And then it's, you know, a lot of people journal and meditate, but this is like, talk about a self-help practice. It's to, to put it out there. And as you said, as you continue to repeat it, it becomes a, a bit of a mantra or some bit of self kind of uh, inspiration that you can continue to call on. Yeah. It's, I love it. That's why, you know, I, I've written on both sides of those, uh, you know, ranges that we talked about earlier with pain. I've definitely written from a victim place many times, and I've definitely written from a place of blame you know, many times. And I ultimately found that neither one of those things were working for my life. <laughs> so I very consciously, there's a story actually I write in, in the book. I, there was a specific situation. I, I was going through a breakup many years ago and I like got back to my house and I was like, I'm going to write my breakup poem, you know, cause I was so upset. <laughs> So I sit down and I'm like, all right, I'm going to write this breakup poem. And then right, right before I decided to start writing it, I said, you know, maybe let me like read some of my old breakup poems first. And so I like pull them all up and I'm embarrassed to admit there was nine of them. It wasn't nine different women, <laughs> but I had written nine different breakup poems over the years. And so I read them in a row out loud in my dimly lit apartment. Oh, drinking and it, orange juice. Yeah, exactly. And in the end of it, it wasn't orange juice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and in the end of it, I was like, oh, okay. Like all of these old breakup poems are applicable to my current breakup. And it, it was actually 
surprising to me. I, you know, it, if I had taken any of those breakup poems, it matched the feeling I was having. So then I said, okay, I don't need to write a new breakup poem. I need to figure out why I'm continuing to create the same lesson in a different disguise over and over again. And I think ultimately that was one of the lessons that taught me not to write from here or from here, but to write from that center place. And then I am making sure that whatever it is that I'm saying is something that I want to manifest. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, look, the, the cover of the book. Uh, that was my next, that was it. Yeah, so yeah, let's I'll talk tie about it. this in. Yeah, you know, the cover of the book, you see the branches of the tree and the roots and they mirror each other. So when you turn it upside down, the roots become the branches and the branches become the roots. And when you turn it to the side, it's lungs. And that's why the two halves of the book are inhale and exhale. And inhale is the personal poems, and it's about my life. It's like my poetic hero's journey, I guess. And ultimately, I think it's about alchemy. Um, and then exhale is the social and political stuff. And it's change yourself, change the world. And that uh, what we have on the inside of us is really a mirror for what we see on the outside of us. And that's why it's so important that we really uh, measure what we say to ourselves and other people carefully and choose our words wisely. And uh, that also extends to my art and making sure that I'm choosing my words wisely in my art for myself and for my audience. And that's why the book and many of my poems uh, ultimately wind up uh, leaving people with hope and empowerment and infinite possibilities because that's what I want to remind myself of. Mm. Well, with that in mind, I would love if you would share a poem or two or whatever you feel called to share with the listeners right now. Yeah, is there anything that you specifically want to hear? I know you'd mentioned Father Time really? earlier. Yeah, I want to, you know, I want to hear growing up too. That's for all the all the listeners out there. But yeah, Father Time, um, yeah, that was really powerful. For I me. can actually probably tie them in together. I bet you can. <laughs> growing up is about learning and then unlearning everything we have learned. It's about constructing and then deconstructing who we are at every turn. Disrupting being in the flow to contemplate the tide. Then letting go again to take the ride without your mind. I'm staring at the number wondering if I should call. I can hear the tick-tock from the clock on the wall as it meshes with the thump-thump beat of my heart. Sometimes getting something started is the hardest part. I didn't meet my dad until I was 15. I'd seen his photograph, but his image was sickening. A coward with a dick, but no balls to back it up. See, when he left me as a kid, I had cause for acting up. The funny thing about hate is the person you hate doesn't feel that hate. You feel that hate, but wait. The weight can be too much for a person to take, and personally, I was hurt, so I just locked it away. I was angry all the time, and I didn't know why. I couldn't handle my rage, so I would hide it inside, pretending everything was fine became a daily pastime. Time passed, and I started to believe in my own lies. I took it out on my mom because she raised me alone. The rage I couldn't own had left me totally numb. It was like landmines in my mind that I didn't understand. So when the boy inside cried, the young man outside yelled. I think I learned about my masculinity from TV. The people weren't real, so I knew they couldn't leave me. I would sit there for hours right in front of the tube. The images that I saw were my depiction of truth. It was manhood in a box, and I bought into it. The censorship of anything inside of me that's sensitive. 
The sentence is, a lifetime of tears, suppressed in a stone face, an overblown ego they've distracted through a paper chase. Back when I was nine, I imagined in my mind that my father was a spy working for the FBI. And that's why I couldn't stop by, write, or drop a line. He was off saving our lives from the bad guys. But that was just a lie that I used to get by so that you wouldn't see the tears welling up in my eyes. When you're rejected by the person that you're created by, you secretly feel like you don't have a right to your life. I thought if I confronted him, then it would make it all right. But since I couldn't forgive him, it just recycled my spite. I remember meeting him for the first time. Every time a person passed by, I would ask, Mom, is that him? I look a little like him, right? No? Oh. Well, what about that guy? And that was what it was like to meet the man that gave me my life. To shake his hand and look into his eyes. We talked till he apologized, then said our goodbyes. I walked away on my own, and I began to cry. Now, for years after that, I acted like it was all resolved. I had told him what I thought, so I figured problem solved, but it just re-evolved. My insecurities were eating at my mental health. I took it out on the world because I hated myself. That's when I finally decided I needed some help. I opened up. I started writing and sharing about my past. I got honest with myself and I started chipping at my mask. I looked into the mirror and confronted what I saw, accepting the reflection by embracing every flaw, then directing the connection into breaking down the walls by reflecting the perfection of the God inside us all. I stopped focusing on everything that I had been hateful for and started focusing on everything I could be grateful for. And personally, there is a lot I can be thankful for. If pain is dragging you down, just cut the ankle cord. That's when the weight lifted and I really started living. It's when my hate shifted and I really started giving. It's when my fate twisted. It was like an ego exorcism. <laughs> Your mind state can be the most powerful of prisons. My father never played catch with me or gave advice. But if nothing else, that man gave me my life. And that's enough for me. If that's all he can ever give, because I'm appreciative for every day I get to live. And even though I don't need my dad to validate me, I thought that I should write this poem to thank him for creating me. Because every moment we are alive is like a gift. And if that's not enough to forgive, then what is? I'm staring at the number wondering if I should call. I can hear the tick-tock from the clock on the wall as it meshes with the thump-thump beat of my heart. Sometimes getting something started is the hardest part. I pick the phone up. The dial tone begins to sing. I punch his number into it and it begins to ring, ring, ring. Hello, Mike. Hey, man, it's, uh, it's Adam. Your son. Whew. Well, obviously, there's, 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 there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and that's a whole podcast in and of itself. But one of the things that really stood out for me um, is this idea of male role models, you know, so growing up with a single mom, um, 
it sounds like you, there was it was tough to find that other than on TV. And I wonder how clearly that depicts, you know, what it was like to grow up, like that, what, who your father figures were growing up. I mean, I, I didn't really trust adults, period, you know? Um, but I would say especially men. So um, I didn't have any role models that I actually uh, opened up to in a real way or that I looked up to in a way where I felt actually connected to them. Um, so they were all, you know, sports stars, music stars, movie stars. And, um, and I think that I was looking at what the culture told me a man was supposed to be like, or what my environment, you know, was telling me in terms of the other boys that I was around, you know, telling me what a man was supposed to be like. Um, and so that's why I had a lot of, uh, I think, friend tours. And I didn't always choose the best uh, friend tours. I always chose the best friends. I had great, great friends, man, always. But I look back and I think I was looking to them and just externally in general what I, for what I was supposed to be like. And that I definitely uh, made some mistakes on in my time. But they're mine, you know? Um, I think there was something that we were talking about earlier in terms of, uh, you know, pain and the power that comes from it. And you had mentioned, you know, that some people have been through insanely traumatic experiences. And I, I just, I remember wanting to acknowledge that in the moment that, you know, what I'm talking about is a, a personal strategy that can be used for anyone if it works. Um, but my strategy is not the only strategy and my strategy could change. And one thing that I definitely acknowledge is my own privilege in life. You know, even, you know, of course, being a white male, but American, you know, my, my mom was a school teacher and, uh, but I never needed anything in my life that I didn't get. You know, there are things that happen to us that will never make sense. You know, people have explained situations that they've gone through. I, I can't put any logic or words to that. Um, but I knew, I do know that ultimately whatever happens to us makes us who we are in this moment. And that's why I, I was kind of, uh, emphasizing that earlier, um, that owning that pain and confronting that pain and using it to create rather than destroy is the process of alchemy. Um, and, uh, yeah. I love that brother. And, and, uh, I'm glad you brought that up too, because it is, um, I think what I try to share on this podcast is what are the experiences? What are the things that I've done personally that have worked for me and not worked for me? And it's certainly not a panacea for anyone to figure out their stuff, but maybe it's a step in a direction that they can try it out. But just like anything, we all have to have, I fucking beat the drum on this almost every podcast, but we have to have our own experience with, with all of it to figure out what works. And as you said, this is the strategies. These are the things that have helped you. They may be something else tomorrow or in a month or a year. And, and back to that whole idea, like we, we don't know. And um, not only is it nice to get in, move into that space of not knowing, but I highly encourage people to really investigate why do we feel we need to know about so many things? I have these opinions because it gives us the illusion of control. Yeah, fuck yeah. And nobody nobody wants to feel out of control because you, when you feel out of control, you're unconsciously face to face with your own mortality. <laughs> um yeah. But the thing is, we are all constantly out of control and what a fucking adventure that is. If, if I was talking with a buddy of mine the other day, if this last three or four months has taught us anything, 
we have no fucking idea what's ever going to happen in the future. Like, think about where we were in March as this was just starting to take shape. Look at we are now. Look at the things that have happened. No one could have ever anticipated this. I'm curious to see where we are four months from now. Like mm-hmm. to circle the like. I actually, my buddy and I were talking like, why don't we write down like what we think is going to happen in these different areas of our lives four months from now? It's four months. It's nothing. Right. It's not even like a full hockey season. Like, w- how off are we going to be? But as humans, we think we're so goddamn good at predicting the future. Yeah. Right. And we're always off. We're just eat. Sometimes we're off by a little bit. Sometimes we're way off base. But I think you bring up a great point. It's this. It's not that we're in control. It's we have the illusion of control. And I think that that nuance is really important because we are so. We have no control over so much of that of what happens. And I think that's where I've struggled as a parent at times is when I've tried to reel them in and control them. And it's, as I said earlier, like they show me where I'm not free. Like, why is that triggering me? What my son's doing right now? Right. What is wrong? What, what's coming up for me? And so um, I'm glad you brought I think, that up. I think in, in general too, you know, I can't speak on the, the parenting aspect because I'm not there yet, but, um, but I know that that's certainly the greatest adventure in life. And it's, it's certainly the highest form of art because you're creating art that continues to create without you. (laughs) Um, You know, but uh, the control thing is interesting because uh, I think it's only in acknowledging that you can't control everything, that you can actually be present to what's happening. And there's a lot of uh, power in this moment and in reality. And if you're trying to control everything and predict everything before it happens, you're so focused on your expectations that you're not actually uh, in the world. And there's a lot of information in the world. So um, I think uh, at least that's something that I'm constantly trying to remind myself of. And yeah, I mean, in terms of the virus, I mean, that's an example in my own life where uh, I've tried to gain control over something that is completely out of control. Like, definitely, I had a show in, um, I don't know when it was, it was like sometime in March, I guess, like the beginning of March or the end of February or something like that. But it was before everything had really gotten um, out of control. (laughs) And, uh, and yet I had been following it incessantly. I was like following the virus every morning, looking at the news, like just an insane amount. And I was at a conference for uh, meeting planners. And, you know, because I, I do 70 shows a year before the quarantine all around the country and the world. And so I'm like, you know, at this conference and I do this performance and I finish and it's standing ovation and I walk off stage and my manager, Kevin's there. Shout out to Kevin. And uh, he goes, great job. And I said, do you think any one of these people in this room knows that there isn't going to be any more events in 2020? (laughs) So I was way ahead of the curve. And yet still doesn't matter. I still got, uh, you know, impacted like everybody else. There was no way for me to... uh, you know, get out of the way of the wave. I had to ride it. Yeah, dude. And it is, it was crazy. Like we, I had flown up to Cleveland for one of my best friend's birthday and we went up and a group of us went to see Steve Aoki play. It was that night, the last night of any concerts in America. Right. I was like, holy shit. Like that was the night. When that was, was that? Everything got- On the calendar. It was uh March 11th it was a wednesday i flew back thursday we were supposed to leave for spring break on that friday okay it got was it. like getting iffy and we're like you know what we're not going on spring break got it okay so then that show with the meeting planners was uh the middle of february yeah so 
Um, and then, of course, it's crazy how everything accelerated. But really, the, the point I was trying to make is if you're overly controlling the moment, you're not in the moment, and then you can't respond to the moment because you're not present. Yeah, and that, that, that may be hard for... If it's hard for you to understand, I get it. It just means that that's a part of your life that you could really investigate and maybe create a lot of freedom for yourself. I think um, just speaking from experience, you know, even again, recently, like as I've been in this kind of reset mode and, and, and just trying to see how I want to move forward, there's still been this underlying intensity of like trying to control some of these different aspects where again, this morning it all just fell away and I felt so good. So, well, it's like, like this moment, for example, what do I want? I want to have a great conversation with you. I want all the people that listen to this to like me. What the fuck is wrong with that? I want everybody to like me, of course. I want people <laughs> to buy my book. You know, I want to make points that are going to help people's lives or hopefully like open up, you know, something that will give them a new avenue, you know, to approach something in their lives. Um, but also like, I have to be present to what's actually happening. There was a lawnmower in the background. It's a fucking fly that keeps coming <laughs> through the camera. You know, you had to step away for 10 seconds, you know, because yeah, I had the, the leaf blower going here. I was like, fuck guys, I'm recording. It, you know, so the point is, is that if I'm so like holding on to what I want to happen, then all of these things become super like, oh, you know, out of, you know, rather than it's just like, oh, this is happening. Okay, now a fucking fly went by. It's all good, man. Like, and actually connecting to you and even discussing this yeah. is a part of what it means to be here with you and not allow the expectations or the desires or the goals that I have to outweigh reality. Yeah, beautiful. And you're right. Um... Uh, I, my first inclination was like, fuck, the, the guys are, the, the, he's getting closer and closer with the leaf blower. And I'm like, well, I'll just, it's happening. The, it's just happening. And so I'll just tell you to keep talking and I'll get off and just tell them to, to cut it and we'll be good. Like it's, it's not, it's not going to do anything except as, as it turns out, enhance the podcast because it gives us something else to talk about. And the fly, by the way, is literally, it just landed on my computer. Okay. And yeah, this definitely. fly doesn't care about my goals for this podcast. <laughs> it doesn't care. It, 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 it's not no. even aware of what is a goal. Like for me, you know, it, you know what else? It has no anxiety around the coronavirus. You know, that's why it's kind of cool to be in nature because, you know, nature has no concerns. In, in fact, there's a possibility that this is, part of mother nature saying no, you know, and putting us in the corner and saying, think about what you've done, you know, in terms of continuing to profit off of the suffering of people on the planet over and over again and how unsustainable that is. Um, so maybe there's a consciousness as a whole behind nature that has brought this experience to the forefront. And I'm not in any way devaluing anyone's pain or suffering because I know that there's an enormous amount out there but there's our micro experience and there's the macro experience. And uh, both of those things are happening simultaneously. But when I'm in nature and I'm walking around, you know, to my understanding, it, it doesn't care about anything. It's just present. The mountain doesn't want anything from me. It's not trying to sell me shit. It doesn't want me to even like it. You know, I, I, I respect the mountain even when I don't enjoy the climb. You know, uh, so I, I don't know what, how we got there, but popped No, I think, and I think the mountain is just showing up as the mountain. And that may sound weird to people, but the, the, like that's what it does. And, and you know, it's a, a good friend of mine, Boyd Vardy, who's a lion tracker in South Africa. He's like, look, like the, the leopard... The leopard isn't doing anything but leoparding. Right. It just, that's all it knows how to do. And that's simply what it does. We 
pile all this other shit on there. And once we can start to wade through it, we get those moments of being in cue, of being callous. Like, oh, that's what it means to be me. Oh, I haven't felt that for a while. Well, that felt good. I didn't have to think about anything. I didn't have to strategize. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to think about what that person may want to hear from me, what they may want from me, what I want from them. It's like fucking, oh my God, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And then you don't know who the, what, what the fuck just happened. Right. I just spent an hour with someone. I have no idea what that was. Right. But I feel shitty. Right. Well, because it's heavy to keep holding up the mask. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and to ourselves first. You know, I mean, we hold it up to ourselves. We don't want to see ourselves. We don't want to acknowledge um, all of the pain or all of the things that we're ashamed of from our past. And yet there's a lot of power in that as, as we've discussed. You know, there's, I think about it, I, there's, I don't think there's any other life form on the planet. Maybe this is an exaggeration, but none that I can think of that pretends to be something that it's not. <laughs> I mean, no, I think we've got that cornered. It's crazy, you know, that we would actually be walking. I mean, it's really amazing that we have these minds and we have imagination and we can create things. It's unbelievable. But first of all, human beings think that they are the highest form of life and they're not. We might be the most advanced form of life in certain ways to our measurements, but we're not the highest form of life and we're not the end of life. Life has a mind of its own. Life just wants to evolve. There will be another evolution of a higher life form or, you know, at, at some point, more advanced, I guess, to my own terminology. Um, and it's weird right now that we literally walk around pretending to be things that we're not. You know, if, if, if you could hear the thoughts that were going on inside of my brain, you know, would you think I was insane like probably, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's, this is an interesting thought, you know, it's just, uh, so I'm trying to do my best to not pretend to drop the mask, to connect with people where I am, where they are in the moment that we are. And I am finding that life continues to be more and more gratifying in that way. Not that everything well, is love, easy, but you know, yeah. No, and I love the way you show up like that, and it, it, it's it brings to mind um, your poem therapy, which I mean that in a nutshell, that's one of the things I'm trying to share with people. Like, look, you know, I I retired as a trader at the age of 41, and you know, I think a lot of people projected onto me that I had everything figured out and that, you know, I deserved it and all, all the stuff, mm -hmm. well-meaning, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not that at all. Like I, I've got a lot of shit that I'm working out and that's what I'm trying to share on the podcast um, is to invite others. Like, look, you're not alone. And whatever you think about me, it's, it's part of the truth. Right. There's so much about me, as you said, that, like that I'm not proud of. I try to own it all. I mean, that's part of my process, right? Is to heal that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's we are all going through this shit. All of us. Yeah. Don't think whoever the most, you know, the richest person, the best basketball player, they all have their shit. And so let's just share our shit and like come in communion with this yeah we start to heal it we're, we're all going through this this human thing together and to your point you can't give anyone the answers you can give them your momentary answers for yourself um and you can share your experience uh but everyone that's what makes life so beautiful man we're all so unique uh, we every single person i mean we all share that human experience thing that we were just talking about but we also every single part of us i mean it's a fucking miracle to be alive man um all of it and uh yeah okay look i i know we're bumping up against time here so there's a few things i want to hit first of all we're going to do we're going to do a book giveaway when this episode launches 
And so I'm going to, I'm going to, and this will be in the newsletter, but also uh, if you're checking this out the week that this launches, I, I'm going to want people to send in their best poetry. Now, listen, I will fucking Google a few lines of it. And if I find it someone else's, you're disqualified. <laughs> and so, and, and, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll ask in Q if he'll um, help me pick some of the winners, but we'll do a, a book giveaway I wanted to ask about your podcast. You, you, had, I had seen that back in March you were going to launch a podcast this summer. Is that still in the works? We're a little bit unclear uh, in terms of we definitely want to do a podcast uh, and just have to decide when the, the time is right. Um, I think we have something up for people and people have been signing up and stuff like that. So I just have to record uh, a number of them. But I like you – would enjoy doing them in person. And so I think it's, it's a decision of, do I want to start uh, doing it this way or do I want to start doing it in person? And how long am I willing to wait for that to happen? And uh, I honestly, I don't have the, uh, the answer yet, but if you yeah, sign you up, do. what's that? You have the answer. Oh, tell you me. You said it. You're just tuning in right now. It's now's not the right time. This is, this doesn't, this isn't what you want to do. And I think that's awesome. But then like, again, here's, here's the other side of that. I've really enjoyed this conversation. You know, I've enjoyed connecting with you. And I hope that people find value from this conversation. And, you know, by the way, I'm just sending you guys love wherever you are in the world. I hope you're happy and healthy under the circumstances. And I, I appreciate you taking some time to, uh, to listen to this. Um, so there's that side of it too, you know, and it's just, uh, I guess I have to sort through that to see what, what side is winning. Love it. And that's it. And that goes back to like the theme of today's podcast, just be in the moment. Like what, what, how can you answer that right now? What feels right? And you're right. You may wake up and say, you know what, fuck, I just want to get this going. Right. And it's okay if it's not perfect. Right. Um, I mean, I had a lot of resistance I had had probably six or eight podcasts in the queue when this lockdown went on. So I was kind of safe. Mm -hmm. And then my hand got forced. Right. And it's like, okay, I need to start doing this and I need to embrace it because there is value in this. Now, again, I would prefer to be in your space, in your energy physically, but I also know enough about how this works that it can certainly be transmuted through this experience. And so. And, And weirdly, you know, you'll probably wind up being stronger in certain areas when you go back to in-person interviews because i mean if you think about it you you would never change if your environment was perfect and right now the environment has clearly changed for everyone and we're all being forced to adapt but in that adaptation we're discovering new things about ourselves and uh building different muscles and i think that when we go back to whatever the new normal will be we will uh, bring those new strengths with us. And I'm really curious how it will feel to perform live again. I mean, I'm used to being on stage in front of hundreds or thousands of people. And, um, and yet I've done full workshops and, and digital shows in this square. And I've had to find uh, intimacy in a new way. And so I'm curious how that will translate to the stage. And I'm sure the same thing can be said for uh, anyone who's going through an adaptation in uh, the new world we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, Do you want to leave us with a poem before I really wrap it up? Yeah, sure. Is there anything that you would want to hear? You know what? I had down higher view. Higher view. Okay, cool. Life is all about you and not at all about you. Now that's two opposing thoughts and yet both of them are true. How can we experience everything we choose to do while observing the experience we're having from a higher view? See, it's the question, not the answer, that's the higher you. Otherwise, you couldn't differentiate between the two. Awareness, but of who? I am the journey that I'm getting to. Gratitude is my destination. 
My destiny is perfectly aligned with this location. I am the map, so my rhymes are like road signs. I have everything I want because my imagination's mine. But mine is not enough for me because I am not my mind. I could see it all and never get to see I'm truly blind. I could be it all, but all identity is intertwined. The moon is only bright because it reflects the sun's shine. And I'm not entirely convinced I even write these lines because my DNA is coded by divine design. But if I manifest abundance while humanity is dying, I am equally responsible for all that I'm denying. See, you can tell the truth and still be lying. I did it for years. My perception was a funhouse mirror. And my projection was exaggerated on reality till my reflection back was nothing more than technicality. So who am I if I'm not who I am? What if I didn't have my name or my age or my girlfriend? If I didn't do my poetry, who would I be then? The things that I've become are not the things I truly am. And everything I think I own owns me in the end. Existence doesn't owe me anything, quite the opposite. Existence will exist long after I am missed, so the art is more important than the artist is. It's not a human race. It's just the human race. There's nothing left to chase. We do not run this place. But both medicine and poison are acquired tastes, so I started taking selfies of somebody else's face. Keep loving through your sadness. Keep loving through your fears. Keep loving through your anger. Keep loving through your tears. Keep loving through your failure. Keep loving through success. Keep loving through anxiety. Keep loving through distress. Keep loving through the changes. Keep loving through the death. Keep loving through your movement. Keep loving through your breath. Keep loving until loving is the only thing that's left. <laughs> God damn. I, I highly recommend you all go back and listen to that again. That it was amazing. There's so much in there, brother. I'm so grateful for you coming on today. Um, where's the best people, uh, place for people to find you? Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you sharing me with your community and, uh, and your audience and, um, and for you taking the time as well. And I know this digital space is new for you. So I appreciate yeah. you, uh, going out on the limb with me, man. Uh, you can get the book anywhere you can, you know, we, uh, we have it of course on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, and then we also worked really hard to get it in, uh, independent bookstores. Um, but, with everything that happened and the confusion, sometimes it can be a little more complicated, but I of course want everyone to support their independent bookstores if they can. Um, and then for people to know there's uh, 60 or 70 illustrations in the book. So it kind of has, so it's a guy named Musta Sharik from London, an incredible artist. And we worked with him, uh, you know, really for quite a while to make sure that the images were layered and that they brought out a deeper meaning to the words. And I'm so happy with uh, what he ultimately uh, created. And so it kind of gives the book a Shel Silverstein-esque experience, who I'm a big fan of, but through uh, whatever my style is. And then they can also buy the audiobook on Audible, which is me reading the poems uh, to you. It's like two and a half hours of... Uh, of me reading the poems. And I, I, we spent so much time to make sure that we did justice to the recordings and that it was like an album experience for people. Um, so oftentimes people have actually been getting both. They get the uh, hardcover because they want to hold something in their hands and they like the experience of the illustrations and reading, you know, uh, interpreting it slowly, seeing the formatting we chose. And then they also get the audible. So, uh, they can either listen together or separately so they can kind of hear uh, whatever originally they were meant to be experienced as performance pieces. Um, and if you do get the book, definitely like reach out to me. Let me know what you think. 
you certainly find me on Instagram. I'm at NQ Life, and um, and uh, I would love to hear from you. Tag me, and uh, let me know what you think of it. Awesome. And listen, don't wait for the goddamn giveaway to get the book. If get the book, if you happen to win one of the books in the giveaway, then gift that to someone else. I have not gotten the Audible. I didn't even think about that because sometimes I'll do that as well. I'll get an, uh, the Audible and I'll read along with it. There's no better like time to do it than through your spoken word poetry. So thanks, man. So grateful. Yeah, people do. Um, seriously, people have been listening to the whole thing. It's crazy. In I've one gotten, shot? Yeah, dude. I, we've gotten hundreds of messages from people that, you know, <laughs> so they've been listening, you know, some people are even uh, taking psychedelics and then they just like put it on and have a crazy, crazy you? trip. So, yeah. um, or going into the forest and whatever. So, you know, it's choose your own adventure. Awesome. So great to see you, brother. Thanks yeah, man, to connect and um, good luck in whatever you're doing next. Thank you, man. You too, man. And I'm looking forward to building more. You bet. Much Bye. love.